Go for it. Friggin' what up, dude? Um, it's Carter Wilson, and I'm the host of this podcast that's mine. It's gonna be called History is Nice. History is nice. Friggin' what up, dude? Fired up for another ep of history is dank, dude. I'm your host, Strider Wilson, dude. What up, dude? Strider Chilson. <laughs> I like to entertain myself sometimes. Aaron on the sticks. What up, Aaron? What up? Dude, just chilling right now, dude. Just being fired up right now, dude. Just being a dog owner. Just two dog owners just podcasting right now, dude. Friggin' fired up, dude. Friggin' Hudson, dude. Smart dog, dude. Sunny, dude. Cute little guy. Well-behaved, dude. I've been just... You know what I've been doing, dude? I've just been cruising to the park, just going on walks, dude, enjoying vistas, freaking getting ice cream by myself, but having a dog. And I realized, dude, maybe you had this realization, like, if I were to do all of those things, like, as an adult male, just go to a park, sit on a bench and look, or, um, you know, just enjoy a view, but alone, or, uh, you know, eat ice cream as an adult alone. Um, one might say that guy's probably a weird pervert. You know, what's going on with that guy? What are you staring at? Why is an adult without a child eating an ice cream cone? No animal with him. If you've got a dog, it's like, oh, he's walking a dog. You know, you stop for an ice cream. Great. It's right there. You know, it's B and R. Why aren't you going to hit it up, dude? And, you know, if I'm enjoying a view with my dog, it's like, oh, I must've gone on a hike and now I'm just taking a break, you know, rather than just like thinking about how my life is spinning out of control, you know, and just watching the freeway or, you know the ocean thinking about you know stuffing it my suit pockets full with you know every piece of change i have in my center console and just walking out into the water you know but um you got a dog people don't think that you know dude so sort of interesting realization i had just while you know having thoughts just having a dog it's like dude you throw a frisbee and there's no animal to catch it weird can you could even be playing frisbee golf but people aren't going to think that you can go weirdo sad dude i mean if i'm picking up shit if i'm just by myself out and picking up shit people are gonna go what's this guy doing he must love shit it's like no i'm keeping things clean doing my part my civ- this isn't even my civic duty i'm going above and beyond you're welcome but i've got a dog and i'm picking up a deuce it's like oh you're doing your job interesting dude yeah when we when we pick up our dog after our dogs like it's not for the neighborhood per se. Like it's, that's biodegradable. That'll that'll be fine. We're doing it for our neighbors, you know. Yeah, we're doing it for them, so they don't think we're assholes. Dude, and it's like their little kid could run out there and pick up your dog's poo, and then that's yeah. gross. And then they got to wash their kid's hands or slip in it or something. Yeah, yeah. and then you got to think about the gardeners are coming. Mm-hmm. Then they're gonna they're gonna do their job, and they step in a piece of poo. That's that's ruined their day. Then they got to get in their car. So yeah, you're doing it for you know, although like crazy. I, I did have a guy. Uh, one day I walked Hudson, and in front of this guy's house, uh, Hudson started going, and I realized oh, I didn't replace the bags. Oh yeah, last night. Oh Been shit. There. So I'm like looking around for just a random piece of trash. Like God, can there please be a sandwich bag or something? Mm-hmm. Uh, bread bag, anything. Uh, old fast food bag. I don't care. Uh, stuff I normally hate to see on my street. I kill for it right now. Nothing. So I'm like, all right, I'll come back. I'll take Hudson home, and I'll come back in the car. And as soon as I got home, I was like, nah, I'll, I'll just walk over there tomorrow. Dude, exactly. There's no way. <laughs> dude, there's no. I always reload after every walk. I reload the bag, dude. That's a, that's the move. Yeah, but uh, so I, I come back the next day to pick it up, and I'm not even at his house yet, and he's, he's got his phone out, and he's clearly about to show me the footage, and I'm like, no way. Let me dude. stop you right there. And explain that I just ran out of bags. I'm not an asshole. Dude, that's amazing. And he totally, he totally backed down. It was cool, but it was just like, okay, buddy, you were ready for a confrontation. Yeah, this guy's intense. This guy sounds intense. I almost yeah. wish you would have left it at that point and lit it on fire, dude. Billy Madison style. <laughs> dude. He's like, I have two dogs. I'm like, I, I, hey, I know. They bark, they bark at my dog. They all, mm-hmm. they're friends. I don't know. But, uh, yeah, don't come at me with that, with that energy, man. I, I'm... I don't want to fight you about this. Dude, exactly. <laughs> I don't care. It's like, come on, dude. That's what I'm saying, dude. And I'm saying, look, even if I have a dog, I still think perverted thoughts. You know what I mean, dude? 
still cruising around the park, dude. I'm still, you know, throwing a frisbee. I'm still eating an ice cream cone, looking at the freeway and thinking to myself, you know, <laughs> thinking sick little thoughts, stuff like, you know, dirty little nuggets, dude. Dirty little, tiny little dirty little nuggets, stuff like, you know, like, you know, what if I moved my freaking credenza so it would catch more light from my skylight even though it blocks half the freaking walkway in our hallway? What if I did that? Fucking naked. You know what I mean, dude? <laughs> <laughs> the dog, dude. Almost, people are taking an effort to just h harness their weirdness. I get it, dude. And dude, dog people, dude, they can go nuts, bro. They can go to 10 real quick, dude. You know? And plus, dogs are freaking cute, dude. So that's just basically what's going on, dude. Aaron, dude, I want to I take both of our dogs and just crap on your neighbor's lawn now, dude. I want to drop a deuce. Human de deuce, dude? Unacceptable. Dog? Taken 10 times out of 10. I'm I stepping mean, in that. Hudson's not far off, so. <laughs> he's got a yeah, sizable. Yeah, he's like 60 pounds, so yeah. Yes, yeah, he can do something decent. All right, dude. Today's historical share. Aaron, you may have heard of this dude. This comes to me from a suggestion via Instagram. What up, dude? Dude named tagged at Wolf of Walmart Official. I love that name. Good fire name, dude. No, uh, I, I don't know that guy. You don't know? No, no, no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, dude. Oh, you don't follow Wolf of Walmart Official? <laughs> I might, but I don't, I don't know. What no, no. Name. Here's the dude I'm talking about, Aaron. <laughs> Ernest Shackleton, dude. You ever heard of this guy, dude? Ernest Shackleton. Sorry, 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 sorry. Uh, it sounds vaguely familiar, but I. All right, dude. You might think more oh. of a more of an Ernest P. Worrell guy, if you're. Wait, who's Ernest P. Worrell? Uh, Jim Varney's character. You know what I mean? I know Jim Varney. Yeah, yeah, the guy, he's always in a great Oh, dude, Ernest goes to, yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah Ernest dude, goes to camp, yeah. You want to know how I know Ernest? First of all, I love those movies, dude. Like, I remember, like, there was one with, like, there's a troll or something with Ernest. Sometimes they're, uh, like. Scared Stupid. Yeah. Scared Stupid, yes. Dude, sometimes things got freaky. But um, in my Spanish class, because, you know, Ernest, um, Jim Varnes was such, like, a, uh, ex his facial expressions were amazing. And how I, like, remembered the emotions in Spanish it was a Ernest doing the emotions. He'd be like doing Consado, <laughs> sad, Tristo, like tired. And then, you know, honestly, dude, I don't know the, any of the other Spanish ones right now. Um, all I know is freaking Fuerte, dude, jacked. So just Ernest with his shirt off. But uh, yeah, dude, what a legend that guy was. Yeah. Ernest, dude. Well, this guy, dude, freaking Sir Ernest Henry Shackleton, dude. You might think he's famous for, you know, shacking bulls to his dome, just freaking clearing volcano, freaking eight-chambered volcanoes and just being unfazed by it, dude, and still being able to answer, you know, hard science questions. But guess what, dude? You know, just freaking fresh herb to his freaking noggin. It's not what he's known for, dude. He's known for exploring volcanoes and other geographic areas in Antarctica, bro. Oh. An Antarctic explorer back in the day. 19 you know early 1900s um you know he went out there in like 1904 first and then the last time in like 1924 uh, but See, maybe my, 22. my my Ernest only went to the north pole did oh did Ernest go to the arctic saves christmas <laughs> saved christmas i, I want to rewatch these i don't dude. think he actually did i think i think this like this led came to him <laughs> i mean as it should it's freaking Ernest, dude it's freaking Ernest is a beast dude dude this guy Ernest Shackleton, bro. Best known as a pol polar explorer, dude. Put that down on the resume, am I right? Now, he went to f he's associated with four expeditions, but today we're just going to be talking about his third expedition because some gnarly stuff went down. Very interesting, dude. And he, he uh, ends up stepping up and, dude, being a freaking straight-up hero, dude. So we'll get into that, dude. Freaking sick. His freaking trans-Antarctic um, expedition, dude. Um, but first of all, dude, I was reading about this, right? I'm like, dude, he cruises down there and he's dealing like he's like in some sort of sea. Then, you know, a little, little teaser here. Some of his men get trapped in like a sound and then they got to like cruise out like on this float to like another like straight past like a gulf. And I'm like, dude, what are all these geographic terms, bro? <laughs> like, what is a sound, dude? Like everyone, like you've heard of the Seattle Puget Sound, right? Mm -hmm. What is that, dude? Yeah, I don't know. All right, dude. Well, I looked at some research here. So if you take nothing from this episode, you're listening right here. This is where you're going to freaking have some fire knowledge, dude. Look this up. A sound is a large sea or ocean inlet 
Deeper than a bite, B-I-G-H-T, and wider than a Ford, F-J-O-R-D. Two terms which I have no idea what they are, or, nar- or a narrow sea or ocean channel between two bodies of land. So, dude, then it says here, there's little consistency in the use of the word sound in English, okay? And I think that's accurate. I had to look up, all right, what's an inlet? Didn't even know what that is. It's an indentation of a shoreline, usually long and narrow, such as a small bay or arm. Friggin' arm? Now we're talking about arms? Okay, that often leads to an enclosed... Okay, so an inlet, it's basically a narrow and long, and it leads to an enclosed body of salt water, such as a sound, bay, lagoon, or marsh. Okay, so if it's salt water, we're talking bay, sound, lagoon, or marsh. Now, there can be bays and lakes, too. So once again, things are getting hairy here, dude. All right, we're, we're in murky waters. So then I had to look up what a, for, a fjord is, dude. Fjord, yeah. Fjord, dude, F-J-O-R-D. It's also long and narrow. It's an inlet with the steep sides of cliffs. That's the distinction. Uh, if there's cliffs, steep and narrow, then you're dealing with a fjord, dude. Often created by a glacier. You're going to see those pups in, Adla- in Alaska, and you're definitely going to see those pups in Antarctica, dude. I okay. only I only know the term fjord from the parrot sketch from Monty Python. Well, uh, dude, you know what? I try to watch that. I'm like, I don't get this sketch, dude. Oh, it's so good. What is what is the parrot sketch? Just he, like he keeps wanting to return a parrot? He's he trying to return a parrot because he was sold a dead parrot. So it's absurdist. Yeah, yeah. And the guy's like, no, he's alive. Look at him. <laughs> he's, he's, he just drops him on the table like, no, no he's dead. Commentary no, he's, on. He's just pining. What? He's, pine, he's pining for the fjords. <laughs> that's, that's the only reason I know that word. <laughs> See, dude, you can learn from watching comedy. You can learn. Dude, freaking straight up learn diction, dude. Freaking learn all sorts of stuff. But you know what? You can't learn about how to write a premise with that one. Maybe you got to pull it off with. Probably take some performance chops to pull off that type of sketch, you know? That's a good indicator. If you take that, you transcribe it and have two people who have never done sketch comedy try to do it. I don't know. It might be genius. Maybe it's, maybe it's actor proof, as they say. In any case, I think it'd be funny if their dicks were out. <laughs> <laughs> They wouldn't be opposed to that. There's dude. plenty, of, plenty of nudity in Monty Python. I love Monty Python, dude. Just like the horse. I love the way they did like in the Holy Grail with the, the horse, like, mm-hmm. <laughs> and then like all of a sudden he's right there and crashing in. I love those cuts. But dude, a lagoon, shallow body of water separated from a larger body of water, dude, by reefs, barrier, and islands. So a lagoon separates bodies of water, whereas like. A marsh, not necessarily dealing with water. It could be land, but there's salt water involved, dude. Then I'm like, all right, dude, there's often these are on barrier peninsulas. What is that, dude? It, oftentimes, lagoons separate atolls, dude. What's an atoll, dude? Is a freaking ring-shaped coral reef. So basically, it's a coral reef that looks like a ring. They look freaking gorgeous. A lot of times, they're on screensavers, dude. Mm-hmm. Um, then you got a K, dude. C-A-Y, sometimes C-A-Y-E, sometimes K-E-Y or a key. Mm-hmm. You know, like the Florida Keys, dude. Little freaking Beach Boys, Aruba, Bahama, Bermuda, ba- freaking what is it? Aruba, Jamaica, Bermuda, Bahama. Freaking dank, dude. It's a small, low elevation sandy island on the surface. Sometimes you pull your boat up to those. It's like where influencers like to party. That's where a K. That's how you distinguish that. Fjord, cliffs. Long, narrow. Ks, influencers park their boats there. That's how you know. And then basically, I looked up the word bay just to figure this out. And basically, a bay is usually called a Gulf Sea Sounder Bite. It's everything, dude. Just call it a bay, bro, is what it comes down to. All right, dude. Maybe call it a cove if you want to make love there. You know, call it a gulf if there's a war around there. It's all just, just could have just looked up bays. So basically, these dudes are in a bay in freaking Antarctica, dude. Freaking Shackleton recruits this dude. And I want to, we're focusing on his third trip to Antarctica right now. That, that's, he, he went four times. Um, and so a little bit of a spoiler with what happens. But because you know he goes again, but um, does everyone? Um, I loved his process of recruiting. Like obviously this guy was eccentric, dude, right? So he goes in his recruitment process. He says, "Look, dude, the four great qualities needed to be an explorer are optimism, patience, imagination, and courage." I love that. Okay, and dude, I mean, you got to have the right squad. It's like anything in life, dude. You, people have skill sets. Anybody can be funny at any time. You know, looking at entertainment and stuff that me and my freaking boys and Chad and JT are doing. It's like, but who do you want to kick it with, dude? I got t- t- plenty of funny dudes, dude. But who do I want to kick? If I'm going on a boys trip to Vegas, dude, who do I want to kick it with, dude? You know, I want JT on the tunes, dude. 
You know I want Chad with his fire snacks. Did you know they want me? Because I got my unlimited Wi-Fi plan in case we get lost in GPS. Dude. Plus, I'm a freaking fire parker and driver, dude. So, I mean, you don't want a group of schmoles is what it comes down to. So, Shackleton's schmoll-proofing recruitment process is freaking dank, dude. The guy receives 5,000 applications, dude, right, in 1914 before he's going to head out, dude, for just 50 positions. He's got two boats that are cruising out there as ships, and he's going to, you know, do... He wants 50 dudes. He wants a crew of like 25 on each. And dude, applications, he sort of in them into three piles, dude. Mad, hopeless, or possible. Love it, dude. Freaking didn't do any shorthanding, didn't do anything else, didn't freaking say, oh, plausible candidates, or everything was just known to be informal and arbitrary, dude, right? No one filled out any forms. There was no, he paid little attention to qualifications, dude. In fact, this one dude, Leonard Husey, dude, this guy, young dude. Apparently, he's very qualified in meteorology and anthropology. And, you know, basically, Shackleton, just to be clear, he leads the expedition. He's the dude who's the badass. He's your Captain Ron. He's like the dude with the eye patch who's grizzled, who has like a jacket made of like seal skin, who's like, I'm going to get us. When you guys are out there doing your scientist shit or whatever it is, you do it, but you're you're listening to what I say because I'm the captain. When I see weather coming in, I don't care if you're setting up your tools or devices or whatever you're measuring the stars or constellations or taking a sample. If we got to move, we got to move. You know, he's that guy. He's gruff. He's rugged. He's been he's he's been there. Okay, and people trust this guy. He's a known explorer. He's been there twice at this point, and now he's like really heading up his big expedition to go across all of Antarctica, freaking map it out. He wants to make it to the South Pole, and he wants to put a freaking post down there, dude. So it's, it's imperialism, dude, is what we're talking about right now. You know, it's, it's glory for the crown, and uh, it's glory for himself, dude. And you know, then scientists want to go along, and Shackleton's known for saying, "Dude, freaking, I don't care about scientists. I bring them along because it adds more prestige to my trip, and it helps me get funding." That's where his head's at. He's like, I want to go on this adventure, dude. So his thing is like, I don't care how good you are at science. Are you a dude that I want to chill with? And can you have a sense of adventure? All right, let's cruise. So he's got this guy, Husey, dude, in the freaking his office in back in London. And Husey, according to him, says that Shackleton's like, looks him up and down, walks around the room, takes his time, basically says nothing, super awkward for a while. And he goes, yes, I like you. I'll take you. And that's it. And then Husey's like, okay. And then he's going to leave. And then Shackleton goes, I thought you looked funny. And then that's it. <laughs> you know, th that's there's how no, he got like, invited. There's no rope. He's got to tie a few knots. Yeah, dude. Yeah, he doesn't need a sailor. No, look, Shackleton's got his sailor, dudes, dude. He's like, okay. he, right. but he will recruit, he'll recruit the seamen and the sailors and all that. But he's like, as far as my science guy goes, like, I don't care how qualified you are. I don't care what you know about anthropology, dude. Like, okay, I, according to me, all of you know about anthropology, but can you chill? And he would even ask later, in a second time, he goes, um, he asked uh, if he had good teeth, which was a sign of health, because he doesn't want to deal with anyone getting sick. And then he goes, uh, he asked if he had varicose veins. I don't know what that meant. Maybe, you know, they're, they're cold and people got to have good circulation. So that sounds pretty technical. And then the question he was known for asking everybody is he goes, can you sing? Dude, the guy liked to freaking <laughs> he liked to freaking jam out and just sing with his boys, dude. Sea shanties. They're, yeah. They're huge right now. Dude, you got to have sing-alongs, right? It's huge. Those are part of poems. I mean, this goes back to our cowboy poetry thing. Sailor songs, you know, war hymns, all these things, dude. He's out there. He, that he knows that's camaraderie, and he wants his dudes. If you're a scientist, dude, and what's going to set you apart? First of all, you've got to be good at chilling, and then, you know, maybe he needs a tenor. <laughs> I, thought gonna, I thought your third, third question was going to be, do you hang dong or? Oh, dude. <laughs> That goes without, you know, that's what he, when he's giving them up downs, he's deducing that in his mind. Shackleton is like, I would imagine this guy like to drop trow. I would imagine he would be out in the old subarctic temperatures and would have little to no regard for how tiny his pecker was and put it straight out into the elements, boosting morale instantly among crew members. Something like that, dude. It would be his account of his story. Freaking. All right, dude. Then there was another guy who was knighted. So this dude was like a very well-known scientist. Um, later, this guy, Sir Raymond Priestley, and um, he goes, Shackleton calls him, and he's like, dude, how would you like to go to the Antarctic, Ray? And um, and then Ray's answer is, I'd go, any, I'd go anywhere to get out of this damn place, he said. And then, soon after, Shackleton sends him a telegram. He goes, basically, he knew this guy, Ray, has a sense of adventure, dude, and that's, gonna, that's why he's going. So he went on the friggin' voyage, dude. 
other dudes that go along are this physicist Reginald James. He was also asked if he could sing, and he was asked if uh, he could see if if he saw gold, if he'd know it. <laughs> Hilarious, dude. So you know Shackleton. He wants treasure. He wants adventure. He wants dudes that he can freaking chill with and have a freaking dank time, dude. Um, Shackleton's uh, leadership was known. He was known to separate chores, like you said, Aaron. Maybe these scientists at first didn't know how to tie knots, but you're in Shackleton's crew. You were going to learn how because he separated chores equally uh, to boost camaraderie among, like, dudes, like the doctor would have to swab decks sometimes, as would scientists, and then other people would have to, you know, there was cooks and stuff who would do their duties, but other people would have to do dishes. Basically, all the other people would have to clean out the shit buckets or whatever you did. Everyone had to do all the stuff you never wanted to do, and he would lead dinner, um, like he'd do huge toasts, he'd lead sing-alongs, he'd have, like, jokes that he'd tell people and games and stuff, so the dude freaking was a beast. He ends up taking 56 dudes, 28 on each ship, um, and then despite the outbreak of World War um, uh, One on August 3rd, uh, that's not when it broke out, but on August 3rd, um, 1914, the Endurance, the first of the two ships, was uh, told to proceed by Lord of Admiralty, Winston Churchill at the time, fun fact there, um, in World War Two, and then later in um, September, um, the second ship, that uh, freaking Shackleton cruises out on meets the first ship Endurance over at um, Buenos Aires, dude, freaking down around the Cape, dude. So they're just posting up down there. And uh, then they go to this little island called South Georgia, which is closer to Andar Ar Antarctica. And then um, the two ships will set out from there, one leaving before the other. One is, uh, and, you know, honestly, like, even reading about it, I don't technically know how this works, but it's like, I think one ship approaches from an area that's been trekked more and leaves like depots, stations with like supplies and fuel and whatever they'd need. So when Shackleton's crew, the Endurance, gets close enough and starts hiking in, um, they can have supplies like for their way out on the other side because it's a trans-Antarctic. And so that's like how they set it up. And so the one ship had like gone and set that out, then cruises back, and then the Endurance is going to go through a very diff a dangerous um, C and I have the map. Let me freaking pull this freaking puppy up right here, dude. It's called the Weddell Sea, dude. So they take off from South Georgia, which is a little bit north. And then once you get to the Weddell Sea within Antarctica, it's basically all like floating ice. So they go in August. It takes months to sail down to Chile. So then now like we're in the um, December months, winter up in the northern hemisphere, southern hemisphere. This is when it's going to be warm enough to go and do this and the ice is kind of melted and you can take a ship and get through it. Um, but still very difficult. And the ship they take is the endurance and a little bit about it, dude, is you say the hole from the outside and look, you got to love talking about ships, dude. First of all, dude, if you're listening to this podcast around your family or, you know, you're at dinner, dude, and you're just disrespecting your family, you got your headphones in, dude, and even though your mom or your dad or whoever made you a nice meal and they go, you know, they say, hey, take your headphones off. What, what are you listening to? Well, then you do take your headphones off now and you let them listen to me talk about a ship. You go, I'm listening and I'm hearing about a ship, dude. What are you guys talking about? What's so interesting over here? Your day? Think I care about your day and what the line was like at the bank? I'm going to talk about the whole of the endurance, dude. <laughs> All right, it looked like that of any other vessel comparable size, except it was not. She was designed for polar conditions, dude. Very sturdy construction, dude. Her keel members were four pieces of solid oak, dude. They'd specifically select these trees, dude. They cruise up to places like Denmark, dude. Dense forests. Look for a nice oak, dude. Imagine if that was your specialty in life. Dude who just goes out, dude, I know how to tell an oak. I can tell an oak, and I know it's going to be good for a hole. Because they didn't want to use multiple trees, because that's going to put splits in there, dude. And we're dealing with polar ice here antarctic ice dude southern polar ice unforgiving dude okay uh, out there in the float dude freaking you got to have that solid one piece of one plank of freaking just solid oak dude and then they'd stack them on top of each other dude 30 inches dude the sides were 30 inches thick dude about a meter of about basically a joe's hog thick of oak dude just sitting there dude twice as many as a normal vessel dude double thickness Built a freaking dank Norwegian fur dude. You're up there, sheathed in green heart, dude. Just thick, thick oak, dude. And then this is the point where you just look at your dad, whoever told you to take your headphones out, and you say, "You want me to put them back in now? Or you want to keep hearing about this?" And they go, "No, turn the bass up on that shit. And let me hear Strider talk about that heavy wood, dude." 
a freaking bow, which would meet the ice head on, dude. Had to be given special attention, dude. If you have a boner right now on your commute, do not try to suppress it. Let it happen, dude. Each timber had been made of a single oak tree chosen. I already said that of its shape. Dude, the curve of the design, a freaking fat bell curve, like my boy Johnny Sims, dude. And we put together these pieces, dude, the thickness of 52 inches sometimes, dude. And then the three masts, dude, basically built like a schooner, dude. Well squared and rigged, dude. 350 horsepower, a coal fire steamed engine capable of speeds of 10.2 knots just in case you needed the extra oomph if the elements weren't giving you the power that you needed. It's beautiful talking about a ship like that, dude. Basically, I was going to say, man, this better be a, a ship with an engine in it. Yeah, it, it, it does have. I looked that up, too. Because also they're putting fuel in those depots. Yeah, yeah. Um, which I was like, what the hell are they need fuel for? Like jet skis and they're on land? I'm like, what? And they're like collecting fuel maybe towards the later depot. So it's a little weird. But yeah, you got to have yourself a little bit of an engine there, cold filtered, or excuse me, coal fired engine. You know, we're in, we're in 1914 right now. And yeah, you needed some power. Um, so basically what they're cruising through in the, this Weddell Sea is ice pack. All right. And they're making their way until on January 18th. And they left in December, so they're going slowly but surely. You can't go too fast. Um, the frickin' ship gets caught, dude. A storm comes up. There's like a northern a northern bound wind that was not uh, good a few days before. They're like, uh-oh, this is not a good sign. But they kept going, and, you know, Shackleton's still trying to keep the morale high. And then Tom, some dude named Thomas Ordlees, Ordlees uh, sounds like he's a, a poet, and maybe he is with his quote. He says, We were frozen like an almond in the middle of a chocolate bar when this frickin' gale pushed the ice together, causing the ship to become trapped. Shackleton tells the crew, We're doing winter in, Ar Ar in Antarctica, men. And uh, basically, another dude who's high up in, you know, one of the sailors, Frank Worsley, tells Shackleton, Dude, the ship can't live like this, Skipper. It may be a few months, and, you know, few questions before but this this keel the hole's gonna give the ice is pushing it too too hard it's unforgiving this type of ice and then um shackleton goes you know you're right and then finally the ship gives way the freaking cracks it's going down um they have to take all the stuff out of it dude they left with 69 dogs legit number what up um you know they had to off a few of the small dogs makes me sad there was even a cat that they called mrs chippy even though it was a tomcat and um they had to t get rid of that cat. They just didn't think it would survive the journey, but they did keep a few dogs. Um, and But, you know, you can't feed all 69 of them. And then these guys go, there's like, there's no alternative. We got to freaking, we got to try to hike in. So they try to, they try to hike towards um, basically across the, the drift towards like this island, Elephant's Island. And from there, they could maybe set sail out to, um, freaking south georgia to get back to like where they where they left from but elephant island would be some place where they could get to and you know not sink because at this point they're just on ice like big chunks of ice living on that floating so they're like well they try to hike off towards land it's not working they only get a few days it's just too cold they make it like half a mile in seven days or no seven and a half miles in seven days Shackleton's like, this is terrible. We're just going to have to rely on the ice flow to get out of here, out of here, boys. So they freaking hunker down. They've got, they're getting lucky on a freaking dank piece of ice, dude. They're doing all right. They'll catch seals. They'll freaking eat those things, dude. They're just posting up, dude, singing songs, keeping morale high. And then basically they're like, they're trying to get lucky though. They're like, hopefully the flow will take us up there. They very well could have flowed the entire other direction and just gone out to another part of Antarctica and the Arctic Ocean, the freaking, um, you know, Southern Atlantic and just died. But the flow took them up there on April 7th. The freaking snow-capped peaks of Clarence and Elephant Islands came into view and the men are filled with hope. Then on April 19th, dude, the ice, the ice split beneath them. A little unlucky. So they just get filled with hope. It's a dangerous thing in these freaking harsh elements, dude. The ice freaking breaks, dude. At this point, they have all their lifeboats that they took off of the Endurance, which are just basically 20 feet long. And they go into some of the most treacherous seas in the world. Think about these huge freaking Titanic sinking ice chunks, dude, that are out there. And they're in lifeboats, bro. And there's a storm going on that split the ice. 
and then it's just this crew, the crew of dudes out there in a few different boats. I think there are five small little vessels at this point, and they just hit the open seas. And Elephant Island's like 60 miles out, but dude, these are treacherous seas, bro. That's just LA to OC, dude. That's freaking downtown LA to San Clemente. But bro, you try doing that in freaking the float? You try doing that in the float? Good luck. Um, but dude, freaking Captain Worsley. So expedition leader is Shackleton, but on the boat, dude, a good leader delegates. He's got a sea captain, Captain Worsley. He navigates through this freaking spray and squalls, dude. Six days. The men are sick. They're taking ill. They've got dysentery, dude. They can't handle it. They're crippling cold. Their bodies are, you know, some of the men are permanently, like, have crippled fingers, dude. Guys are losing their fingers because of tying knots, dude. These scientists even lost some of the fingers, dude. Um, at least half the party felt like they were insane, dude, yet they rode incessantly toward their goal, dude. Important to have a goal, dude. Important to have hope. Important to have a destination, especially in the most trying of times, dude. The men make it to Elephant Island, which is a huge success. They're finally on land, dude. They don't have to deal with the seas, but guess what? They're still marooned on friggin' Elephant Island, dude. They're like, what the heck? We still got to try to get to South Georgia. These seas are too way too treacherous. How are we even going to do it? No one in Elephant Island is too far off shipping lanes or even whaling lanes, dude. Uh, not lanes, but like whaling, like known pockets where they would go. And the, so they're like, we need to try to set out on a, on a freaking another journey excursion to make it to South Georgia. Otherwise, we're just going to live here. No, one, Everyone probably thinks we're dead. We're not going to be back on our time because guess what? By this point in the journey, Aaron, guess how long they've been stranded for, dude? I'm going to say four months. 497 days, bro. Over a Shit. year, dude. Wow. They've been in Antarctica. It's insane, dude. Wow. Just floating on ice, living off seal. I can't believe they're not freezing to death, but, dude, they would just use the boats for little lean-tos and just, I mean, you know, Shekelton had been there before. He knows how to survive in the Antarctic. So they're freaking on Elephant Island at this point, and they take nine days to recuperate from the sea, and Shackleton's like, look, bros, I'm taking one of the boats. We're going to reinforce it, and I'm going to try to set sail. I'm going to need Captain Worsley. And then there's another dude like James Caird, um, who was like a carpenter who really didn't want to go, but he knew that he was would have to repair the boats if it like got hurt, and he was the one who knew how to do it. Then there was another dude who was like just a badass, like dude who was an adventure seeker who's like, I'm going with you guys. And then they took like a... Um, I think like a, a medical dude too and left another medical guy back. And so just those five dudes set out for South Georgia, which is more than 800 miles away in a lifeboat dude, that they just reinforced to deal. Like they built up the walls so it could deal with the waves a little better on it and reinforce the hole. And they just freaking deal with monstrous swells and angry winds, dude freaking just bailing out water the boat dude beating off ice dude the sail they built a sail on that freaking pup or maybe the black boats came with sails it's freaking tossed interminably on the big waves dude under the gray threatening skies recorded Shackleton. every surge of the sea was an enemy but but be watched and circumvented dude it's like he sees a wave coming dude that's my enemy i gotta conquer this one then the next one's behind it i have to conquer it yet unending it's freaking badass dude and so dude then finally, dude, they're getting close to freaking South Georgia, dude, battling these squalls, bro. And the freaking storm hits, dude. They're only a few miles out from there. Another storm hits, dude, blows them entirely past because they're navigating to the north side of the island where the whaling base is. Blows them to the south side of the island. They can't, they're just, their boat just can't handle it. They can't fight those seas. And they finally, they do, they do make land on freaking South Georgia Island, but on the south side. And so then Shackleton goes, Look, we can't go back out in that boat. This boat's freaking on the rocks, too banged up. We're too tired. He looks at three of the dudes, or two other dudes. He goes, you and you, you're coming with me. We're hiking across the island. By the way, at this point in history, nobody's ever done that. He's like, we're going over these mountains. We're approaching from the mountains. No one's been over these Antarctic deal with you. We're not. We're in the freaking extreme cold, and we're going to have to go on a huge mountain hike now. We're going to have to hike like, I believe it was um, a three-day hike. In Arctic, um, subarctic temperatures, dude. Thirty-six hours of desperate hiking, dude. Through over these freaking things. This guy, um, James Caird, was the name of their boat, by the way, the little um, life vessel. And um, then freaking okay, so it's Worsley, Tom Crean, these guys, and Shackleton set off by foot. Um, Tom Crean, I think, is a navigator. And um, 
they freaking approach three days later, dude, just freaking, you know, just crusty lipped, dude. And they're from a whaling thing and the winds were blowing towards their way. So they're getting like, they're just blown freaking by the freaking freaking f- fat freaking subarctic temperatures, dude, and disgusting blubber smoke. So they're just like totally like look charred and frozen, dude, unrecognizable. And they approached one of the whalers from these, from the south from the mountains and the guy's like what the hell dude he comes outside he's like what who are he like thinks they're like phantoms of the night you know he's been tripping out on an island by himself dude he's probably housing whiskey and freaking smoking up whale blubber and building soap or whatever they do dude and he's like oh my gosh he's too terribly like super afraid dude you know sailors always believe in spirits and ghosts dude and he's like what is this what's going on who are you name yourself and then Shackleton's like I am Shackleton and then the guy starts weeping because he knew he thought that they died. Monthly goes, you're Shackleton. Oh, my God. Takes him in, dude. Gets him warm. And then he goes, we need a vessel. We need to sail around to the back of the island in a worthy vessel and get my two other men. He goes, picks up his two other men. They're freaking, these five dudes are rescued. Then he goes to freaking, um, he's like, look, they like rest up for like maybe uh, a week or two, gain their strength back. And he's like, I need boats. We're going back down to get my boys, dude, on freaking Elephant Island tries to go there twice both of his boats get busted up in the freaking ice dude finally dude he's like i need a better boat dude the chilean government lends him a freaking boat dude and um goes freaking cruises down there this is the only one that makes it. the boats called the yelco dude and then finally on august 30th 1916 dude freaking shackleton cruises down there gets his guys rescues them dude and then each morning on elephant island frank wild who was like who shackleton left in command um basically he would tell all the dudes down there um lash up and stow lads lash up and stow the boss may come today so he just wanted to keep that keep that morale up he'd be like any day he could come back any day so just you don't want guys to lose hope lose morale and then um they'd eagerly look out for the relief ship um and then you know, he, he would put in his own private journal, this dude, Macklin, another dude put that like, some of the party have quite given up a uh, hope of her coming. And um, there's no good in deceiving ourselves any longer, wrote Ord, Ord Lees, the dude who said, you know, the poet who said, um, the ship was trapped like an al- almond in chocolate. And uh, then finally, dude, freaking Shackleton comes back for his boys, dude, ultimate bro move, dude, never given up, dude, coming back. And then Aaron, these guys get rescued, and do you want to know they'd been off there um, 128 days, extra days on that island since the Caird left, the James Caird, the little ship left Shackleton to cruise to um, South Georgia for the rescue mission. Do you know how many dudes died, Aaron? I'm going to go low and say like one. Dude. These are hard dudes. Zero. Wow. All these guys, dude, survived in the Antarctica for like almost two years, dude. 20 months, bro, after setting out, bro. All these guys live, dude. Shackleton, ultimate leader, dude, does not leave the men behind. You know, the mission wasn't a success in the sense that they were able to hike across the Atlantic, but or excuse me, um, the pull the trans um, Antarctic hike. But uh, guess what, dude? They did something more, bro. Kept each other alive, created lifelong bonds, dude. The camaraderie from that mission. All the dudes lived. You know, they had lifelong injuries, but. Um, you know, dudes lost some fingers and stuff and frostbite and all that and the mental stuff, but freaking badass, dude. Um, Shackleton then went back, you know, he, he was a heavy drinker and he was going to go back to Antarctica in the early 1920s and he gets to South Georgia and he, um, his doctor at the time was known for like, he like had like a mild heart attack or whatever, or some sort of episode. And then the doctor's talking to him. He's like, you need to stop. And he's like, you always, Shackleton's like, you're always telling me to quit. What exactly is it that you're telling me to quit? You know, thinking he's challenging his exploration and stuff, which is definitely part of why his heart was um, n- not doing so well. But um, the doctor's like, well, primarily, sir, the drinking. And um, it's basically that booze combined with this, you know, gnarly lifestyle. Unfortunately, Shackleton had an early departure. Had a heart attack on South George Island, but you know what? Died doing what he loved. He's a freaking all-time badass dude and an all-time freaking bro dude coming back. So that's it, dude. So thank you freaking at Wolf of Walmart for that suggestion. I was fired up to learn about Shackleton, dude. Freaking dank, dude. I'm probably saying it wrong. Probably Shackleton, dude. Probably been saying it 
Honestly, maybe I just say it like Sheckler, dude, because he grew up in San Juan, close to San Clemente. So my apologies, dude, if I'm saying that wrong the whole time. But, you know, maybe look that up before you share this at work, dude. So um, that's legit, dude. Sick, dude. Aaron, do you think that's pretty sick? I mean, it's crazy. But also those dudes fucked. Those dudes fucked. There's no question, dude. There's I no mean, for warmth alone. Yeah. Where do you drill yourself on an island like that? I mean, if it's subarctic temperatures. In, into your uh, boatmate. Yeah. Bonding, dude. It's legit. It's legit. It's, it's part of what it is, dude, you know? Freaking dank, dude. Freaking horniness kept the dudes alive, dude. The power of horniness. Do not underestimate it, dude. Um, all right, dude. Let's freaking do a few uh, questions and head on out, dude. Strider, where did Aaron get his Aragon sword? Elliot. Amazon, yes. bro. Really? You can get an Aragon sword on Amazon? I did, yeah. I want that, dude. What's that going to set you back? It was 100 bucks. Worth it. That's why I jumped on it. I was Immediately. like, holy shit. Zero question, dude. There's, dude, there's so many swords on Amazon. I, uh, when the pandemic started, I did a lot of looking. I'll tell you what. I did not buy it, but I did a lot of looking. I want a William Wallace sword. I want a Maximus Decimus Meridius sword. I'd love an Aragon sword. Dude, honestly, you know, the like... Broad, the bigger the broadsword, though... It's unwieldy. Like, it's 14 pounds. You'd, you'd tire out immediately. I go with the Dedimus, the Maximus Dedimus sword. Yep. Yeah, the Maximus Dedimus Meridius like Gladiator sword. Very, it seems very practical. Mm -hmm. It's something I could wield and wave around while watching football. It's something mm -hmm. that my Jeff would have to tell me, Strider, what do you calm? You're going to poke Sonny's eye out. And I'd be like, good call, Sonny. Go to your crate so I can keep doing this. Um, dude, sick on Amazon. There you go, Elliot. All right, Noah Ains. What up, legend? I'm going to cut right to the chase, dude. My friends and I want to throw a party this summer because we think by then uh, COVID will have chilled a little bit and it will be safe. Of course, the problem is having a house to have it at. Uh, none of our parents ever leave the house for like a few days, so we need to get them out for a weekend. My idea was to get my parents a hotel room at a nice hotel in Portland for a weekend and put it in an envelope for like a credit card company and say that they were entered into a contest for being loyal customers. We would put a fake number on it so sometimes... We could act as an employee and tell them it's not a scam. Just wondering if you think, oh, like a fake phone number. Just wondering if you think that's a decent idea or if you've ever struggled with the issue of parents never leaving the house. Even before COVID, they never left just for context. Any advice or thoughts are greatly appreciated. Friggin' Dylan, dude. Oh, no, no, excuse me. That's a note to myself. I'm gonna. That's from Noah. Dylan is a DM I want to read after this question. Um, so Noah... I mean, dude, yeah, hopefully freaking COVID's chilling by summertime. I mean, people are getting vaccinated. But as far as, like, um, you know, getting the parents out of the house, that sounds like a nice scheme, dude. Get them a little bit stoked saying, oh, look, you want a contest. Mom and dad's sick, dude. Go stay at this hotel. Um, you know, it's a, you're going to be investing in that dough, that, you know, to get them. But maybe one of your boys has got some good flow, dude. You know, maybe he wheeled, maybe he deals Ambien's or something like that. I don't know. And then he's got some good freaking... You know, or maybe he's got a fat allowance from his parents. And, yeah, you guys book a room for, for your parents, Noah. And then, yeah, dude, that sounds nice. Dude. You get them a couple's massage, treat them to something nice, dude. This is when you come back and you hit a razor and you break a vase or something like that or two of your parents, two of your friends bone in your parents' beds or something like that. You go, look, Mom, Dad, you guys had a nice weekend, didn't you? Let's just focus on that, okay? And then, you know, look forward. I'll clean this up, but we all had a nice time, didn't we? Sick. I mean, I think their scheme sounds good. I mean, we were lucky growing up where JT's parents were chill with us raging at his house. And, like, so I could tell my parents, oh, I'm sleeping at JT's. If my mom needed to call, you know, JT's mom would pick up. And it was nice because we never had to drive or leave. And I think that's basically the main thing. If you're going to get freaking bombed, you know, make sure you're staying in one location. That's about it. You know, and obviously don't go too nuts. You know, try to, you know, get your mellow buzz on, have your pleasure beer while you're on the pong table. And, you know, maybe you do one or two astronaut shots, but you're having a nice time. What do you think, Aaron? Did you ever pull any tricks to get any parents out of the house? Uh, my parents were avid, like, RVers and campers, so that, that helped. They were they would oh. be gone at least a weekend a month. Perfect. Perfect. So, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. That's perfect, dude. Yeah, because otherwise you get caught in the live, like, you know, if you're going to someone else's party, you got to be like, oh, we're all spending the night at this house. And then you're, that friend needs to be like, oh, no, we're all spending the night at that friend's house. And everyone lies and says they're spending the night at someone else's house. And all it takes is one parent checking in to, like, bust that plan up, you know? And then they learn, like, the one parent's out of town or something. So it could be a bust. But I think your plan's pretty foolproof. And I like that you have a, a friend who's 
you're going to make a fake phone number or just put one of your friend's cell phone numbers down. I mean, I'm sure your parents don't know your friend's cell phone number by heart. I barely, honestly, dude, to the other, I was talking about GF the other day. I barely have my GF's phone number memorized by heart, dude, because it's all on my phone now, you know? But now I do. At least, at least you have that. My wife uh, does not know my phone number. Really? See, yeah, it's kind of, it kind of hurts. My GF knew mine, and then I was like, dude, my bad, and so I memorized it. Um, We're going on eight years. But it's no need. I mean, when are you in a pinch? But, dude, you, Aaron, you might be in a pinch. You might Forms. need that. What Forms. If, if you get arrested, do you get to look at your cell phone to learn to get the phone number out, or do you have to know the number off the top of your head? I think you got to know it off the dome. I just That's yeah. what always bothers me in TV and, and film. It's like, these people know these. know these people's numbers? Yeah, no one knows these numbers, you a, dude. You, do you know a lawyer's number? That's what I'm saying. No. 1-800-NO-CUFFS, that's it, dude. But, like, the crime I committed wasn't that, dude. Crime I committed was just being weird, throwing a frisbee to no one in the park. <laughs> All right, I'm pulling up a DM right now because I left myself a note from Dylan, dude. Here we go. Um. All right, Dylan, dude. What up, Strider? I have a relationship question I want to ask you. I had a college GF who was freaking amazing. We kept dating after college. She moved back home to SD, and I got teaching credential in SD, so it was working out. In the back of my mind, I always thought that I would live in my hometown of the Central Coast, San Luis Obispo. You should check it out, but she always envisioned her life in SD. Towards the end of 2019, I just felt like I was in a funk. I thought I was not being the best version of myself, and so I, suddenly I broke it off. We were together for three and a half years. Dang, dude, that's pretty gnarly. Um, okay. I immediately found a new girl in my teaching credential program. She filled the void of dealing with breaking up with my long-term GF. We would play tennis together and do fun outdoorsy things. My old GF was very athletic, but would not go like golfing or go on hikes with me and love my dog as much as I would have liked her to. To make a long story short, the new girl and I, and I both got our dream teaching jobs in the same city, dude. I ended up ending it, with the, ending it with the new girl too because I was feeling anxious and it felt like I was leading her on. I would compare her to my old GF and think that my old GF was better. I now just feel bad how uh, I ended it with both girls. Sometimes I wish I never ended it with my GF, with my first GF. I can't think of anything bad about our relationship, about how our relationship was. I have texted her a few times and caught up a bit, but nothing more than that. I guess sometimes I get caught up in a loop and can't stop thinking about how I wish I stayed in the pocket during those funky times. Should I just move on from both girls? Do you have the tips for how to move on during COVID times? I'm a fitness addict. I meditate, take cold plunges, go in the sauna, but sometimes I still can't shake up the idea that I've messed up even after a long year. Sorry for the long message. It's all right, dude. We got the time. I mean, dude, it sounds like you're a little bit in your dome. I mean, you're, it sounds like you're constantly thinking of like the grass is always greener when you got this nice relationships going, you know, and you met this nice new girl, seemed like that was sweet. I don't know what she was doing or where her dome was at or if she was giving signals to cut it off, but it sounds like you're taking sort of the ownership for that of being like, you felt like you were leading her on, so maybe you weren't that into your second girlfriend, even though she was nice, and I think so that's the right move. You know, you don't want to lead anyone on. You don't want to keep them, prevent them from having the chance to go meet someone who's their right person. Um, as far as your first GF, I mean, sounds like, yeah, I don't know why you broke that off, dude. Like, she sounded like she was chill, dude, and you were worried about cities. You guys could have done distance. I get distance could be drama. Maybe you had those whole talks and that's kind of a bust. I get it. That's a little less stoke inducing. And you were probably young at the time. You're just entering your student program and that's fine. And now you're thinking back to yourself, well, that was pretty great. So I think, you know, you've reached out. Maybe it sounds like she's not too interested in rekindling things that you like touched up. So I think, dude, you just keep going forward, bro. And if she's going to reach out to you, that's cool. But you're teaching, you're crushing, you're in slow. Keep going. Now, don't get me wrong, dude. It's, if I'm thinking movie style, I want you to get back together with your first GF, you know? I want you guys to rekindle that. And, you know, if you love something, set it free. Maybe you were thinking you were doing that, but sounds like, you know, in your heart of hearts, you were thinking, I want to see what else is out there, you know? Um, and that's okay, too. You just got to admit that to yourself and be honest about that with her when you cut things off, and hopefully you were. But now, look, what's what's done has been done, dude, and you got to think to yourself, if it's my vote, dude, I'm saying cruise forward, dude. You might meet a nice lady, and then if you catch yourself in this cycle again, getting in there going, well, I got to wiggle loose, then maybe you got some sort of commitment thing going on, and you just got to say, oh, well, what about her? And then that's so nice because it's so fresh. It sounds like maybe you're getting to a point in your, these relationships where things are about to get real serious, or you're th three years in, you're thinking, now am I going to pop the cue, and this is going to be my forever, and maybe you weren't quite ready for that. So, dude... Honest self-introspection is important to do and very tough to do. So um, it sounds like you're taking the right steps towards doing that. 
and um, you know, just feel it out with the next lady you meet. And if you start wiggling in your, your space boots, maybe go, well, what is this really? Is it really because I'm not into this girl or am I into this girl? And it's, or and is it because I'm, I don't want to settle down and I want to, you just got to be honest with yourself and, and honest with her. But hopefully at this point you're, you're, you've grown enough. And I love that you're freaking in the sauna and freaking lifting weights, dude, and crushing and tanning and getting, spreading your butt to the sun and getting that vitamin D. And I think just now it's just about spreading open that heart, dude, and getting that vitamin L, dude, and letting it in, letting it help you grow. What do you think, Aaron? I mean, you should definitely move forward. Uh, mm -hmm. But you can't do that until you can let go. Like, you have to... You can't be comparing... I mean, it's just... They're not the same. You're not the same person. Yeah. You're not the same age. You're not in the same circumstances. Like, who knows? You could get back with the your first girlfriend and it'd be kind of miserable because you're different people now or... Yeah, she could have a new tattoo. He's shifted. Yeah, she could have a gnarly uh, snake tattoo or a mm -hmm. dagger somewhere on her that mm -hmm. is a is a f red flag to yeah. say the least. She's into the devil now. Yeah, she could be totally into the devil. You just mm -hmm. you just don't know. You're not going to find that out via text mm -hmm. uh, unless she's like, "Hey, what's up, dude? I'm into the devil now." Yeah, sorry, I got devil church today, <laughs> dude. Let's meet up after. Let's do brunch after. Uh, yeah, I mean, you just you you can't compare. You can't. Uh, you have to be careful of that feeling trapped thing because it's just like, nah, man, just feel grateful that you're with someone cool. Like, so I don't know if that was uh, the wrong move on the second girl, but you know, uh, you have to you have to answer that for yourself. Yep, it sounds like you're making positive. Yes, keep going forward, dude. Respect the distance with these ladies. You know, maybe you do a little heartbreaking, so let them. They got to get past it too in their own own way, and um, yeah, Aaron, fire advice. Fire up, dude. Dude, go on an adventure, bro. Maybe not Antarctica, but dude, do a little Shackleton. Go on a hike, dude, you know? It sounds like you like doing stuff outdoors, dude. Like you have these deep thoughts, dude. Do your introspection in a beautiful place if there's anything, if no one's ever done it. Don't do it in your bed at night or while you're brushing your teeth. Do it somewhere nice, you know? Do it in a sauna. Sometimes I get introspective after I drill myself. I go, hmm, am I being the best version of myself? <laughs> Maybe I am. Maybe I'm not. You know, something dank to think about. So, put that in your freaking cup of tea and drink it, dude. Um, hopefully, you freaking enjoyed this ep, dude. I'm a little inspired by Ernest Shackleton. I want to go out and take an adventure. I want to do something fun. I want to have my bros' backs, dude. That's what I'm taking out of this: is loyalty, dude, and never giving up, dude. Not on yourself or others. So, Aaron, thank you, dude. Freaking stay stoked. Please give me more episode suggestions i like doing them i like learning about new stuff and hearing what you guys are interested in sharing it's a fun little community we're building a freaking community of dankness dude so strider wilson treads at gmail.com or dm me dude um all right dude freaking lit